Hey everyone, it's good to be with you as we gather together to dive into the Word of God, to grow with Him and to learn with Him. We're going to talk today about learning to do what is right in God's sight. And often that is easier said than done, right? I sure think so. There are moments when I'm like, oh boy, how are we going to get there? So I want to welcome all of you. My name is Ruth Hendrickson. If you are joining us for the very first time, I want to invite you to go to the website. The website is ruthhendrickson.org. We have all sorts of material on there just to help you as you grow with the Lord. As we navigate through this crazy thing called life, we want to do it with the joy of the Lord, for that is our strength. So again, I want to invite you to go to the website, ruthhendrickson.org. Just take a look at those resources. And while you're there, I want to invite you also to sign up for the email list. Join the family. We only send out one to two emails a week. I really don't like to be bombarded with emails myself, so I'm not going to bombard you. And remember, if you find that they are not beneficial, you can always unsubscribe, but why not give it a try and be part of the family? All right, here we go. Learning to do what's right in God's sight. Okay. It can it can be interesting to navigate that, but here's the thing. As we learn to do that, as we learn to do what is right in his sight, to do it his way, then we can truly learn to dance in even the fiercest of storms because we lean back into the presence of God, the passion of God and the joy of God, because scripture is very, very clear that it's the joy of the Lord that is our strength. But when we're not doing things God's way, when we're not obeying his laws, when we're, when we're not obeying what scripture says, when we're trying to live a different way, when we go outside the guardrails, the safety net that he's placed around us, we can't dance through those storms. Those storms actually engulf us and they can consume us. But when we're doing life his way, there is a guarantee that we can dance through the storm and the world will look at us and say, oh my gosh, he's crazy or she's crazy. How do they do this? What do they carry? What is different? But the thing is, is right now, especially with the cultural shifts that are happening all over the place, sometimes knowing that difference between right and wrong it has is muddy water. It can feel like muddy water. We're getting bombarded on so many sides with things that, you know, you have to be politically correct. You have to be culturally correct. Um, you don't want to offend everyone. Let's be at peace with everyone. Um, you know, hey, can't live here. All these various things. And, and the thing is, is we're called to be carriers of the kingdom of heaven, which means we don't hate, we love, but we love radically. And sometimes that love looks a little different than how it looks in the world because we love people by calling them to the truth, by calling them to life, by calling them to become the man or the woman that God's called them to be, by speaking kingdom principles into them, by, by modeling that and not giving in to the culture of the world around us, but yet presenting a different look, something that's so much better. So one of the things that I wanted to ask is, have you ever found yourself going in a direction that doesn't align with God's will? And as a result of that, when you look back, can you see that through that season, you didn't dance through the storms, things were actually much more challenging. And then from there, we end up trying to find out how to get back on track. I mean, it's like we wandered off the path. Have you ever gone hiking and, you know, the paths are marked out, but yet you lose that path or you want to go explore something and then you can't find your way back. You have trouble finding your way back. Well, that same thing can happen in our walk with Christ. That's why we need each other to help pull us back onto the right path, to help pull us back onto that trail. But you see, the thing is, God's so good. He is so amazing. But we have to understand that we can, we can, you know, what can we bring him? So often in the midst of that struggle, in the midst of being lost, we try to do things our own way. We try to do what we can do to fix the situation rather than, again, doing it God's way. Micah 6, 6 to 8 says, what can we bring to the Lord? What kind of offerings should we give him? Should we bow before God with offerings of yearly calves? Should we offer him thousands of rams and 10,000 rivers of olive oil? Should we sacrifice our firstborn children to pay for our sins? Verse 8, know, O people, the Lord has told you what is good and what he requires of you to do what is right and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. 
So let's go back. Verse six. Great question. What can I bring to the Lord? That's a question we should be asking. Lord, what can I bring you? What can I give you? What will minister to your heart? What can I bring to the Lord? The problem is right here in this, that that question is being asked, not out of love, not out of relationship, but really just trying to placate the situation. The heart isn't in the right place. You see, they're trying to do to please God. They're trying to do to please God. How often do we do to please God? Now think about this. In Micah, we have the Old Testament sacrificial system in place. So the question about the yearling calves makes sense because that might not fit in our culture right now. But the question is, what type of sacrifice? What, what do I need to put on that altar? I guess it could fit now. Let's take it, Lord, what, what, what do I put on that altar? What do I sacrifice before you trying to please you? You know, at the risk of meddling a little bit, sometimes it's, well, I'm going to fast because I want God to do this. And, and we're not fasting because we were told to, but there's this sense of manipulation behind it. Maybe that would be a good analogy to try to bring that home into today. But we go from that, we go from what can we bring to the Lord? What can I do? And just say, I, what can I do to what kind of offerings? But then, you know, it, it keeps, it keeps crescendoing. It keeps, it keeps escalating. And, and it goes to the whole concept of offering the firstborn children. Now, what we need to understand here is number one, the heart of the issue is never dressed. And they're moving as that crescendos. What, what do we need to do? What do we need to do? What do we need to do? It crescendos into, into a cultural practice of sacrificing children to the gods. You see, what happened is the knowledge of God became intermixed or skewed with what the world wanted or what the, the world demanded, what the culture was doing, what they were doing to, with their idols, sacrificing their children. You see, the basic point is that God is not pleased if we elevate one aspect of what he requires of us while ignore the rest. So they know they need to offer an offering. They know that there needs to be some sort of offering. But they're mixing in, they're, they're, they're skewing it with other things of the culture rather than the purity and saying, Lord, what you really want is my heart. What you really want is the whole of my life. It's what can I do to you for you? I just relinquish, I release myself to you. Hosea 6.6 6 says, for I desired mercy and not sacrifice and knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. Yeah. Romans 12, one to two out of the Passion Translation says, beloved friends, what should be our proper response to God's marvelous mercies? I encourage you to surrender yourselves to God to be a sacred living sacrifice and live in holiness, experiencing all that delights his heart. For this becomes your genuine expression of worship. Stop imitating the ideas and opinions of the culture around you, but be inwardly transformed by the Holy Spirit through a total transformation or total reformation of how you think. This will empower you to discern God's will as you live a beautiful life, satisfying and perfect in his eyes. You know, I look at that and I, I go back to Micah. You know, as we look at what can we bring to the Lord? First question in that in Micah 6.6. 6, we go to Romans. What should be our proper response? Goes on. Surrender. Surrender yourselves to the Lord to be his sacred living sacrifice. What can I give to the Lord? I surrender myself. I'm, I'm, I, I live in holiness. In other words, I live the type of life he wants me to do. I'm not sacrificing to idols. And I'm definitely not sacrificing my children. But I'm... I'm living in alignment to his word. And that becomes the genuine expression of worship, of my love, of my adoration to him. Which also means, then we go remember again, that crescendo that we saw in Micah. Jump back to Romans. Stop imitating the ideas and opinions of the culture around us. That's a big, big command for right now. Stop, stop, stop it. Stop imitating the ideas 
and the opinions of the culture around us. We have to begin to live differently and have that total reformation. I love the Passion Translation for that. Inwardly transformed by the Holy Spirit through a total reformation of how you think. In other words, there can't be anything left in our thinking that does not align with the word of God. And then, of course, we have a promise with that. This will empower us to discern God's will as we live a beautiful life, as we dance in the storms, as the joy of the Lord is our strength, as we see things differently, as we view life from a different perspective, as we invite others into that journey to see the beauty of who God is and all that he has to offer, the healing that he brings, the creative ideas, the wonder of who he is. And we become satisfying and perfect in his eyes. You know, back to Micah, the Lord has told you what is good. And this is what it requires to you. It's verse eight, to do what is right, to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. What is right? That Hebrew word is often translated as justice. In other words, do what is right. Treat others in a fair, non-manipulative and non-oppressive way. Mercy actually means is, is passionate, undeserved loyalty, def, you know, defining undeserved loyalty to do what is right. What does God require to do what is right, to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God? You know, as I wrap this up, I just want to read Lamentations 3, 22 to 23 out of the English Standard Version. And this is so good because you see from all this, from all these questions, from what do I need to do or, or how do I, what, how do I, how do I satisfy the Lord? How do I walk with him? Lamentation says the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. You see that doing what is right and walking humbly are actually incompatible with human ignorance. When we move, as we walk, as we think, the motion, the movement, and the relationship all are connected to our intimacy with God. So how do we learn to do what is right? We really have to relinquish sometimes our, our wants, our desires, the world standards, trying to mix the culture in and live differently. And from that place, we know what his goodness, pleasing and his perfect will is. We, we offer that true sacrifice of worship. We become totally, totally transformed or in the way that we think. We discern God's will and it enables us to dance through the storms because we see differently and to live that beautiful life, which we're called. Yeah, life on this earth is not always easy. There are challenges and we have to learn to do what is right in God's sight because it makes all the difference as to how we walk through this portion of our lives because where we're at right now is only a portion of our lives because as a follower of Jesus Christ, we're promised an eternity with him. But part of that is, is getting through this portion but we're made to dance through the storms. We're made to bring the glory of God into those storms, the creative resources of heaven, the healing into those storms. But we can only do that when our culture that we're immersed in is a heaven culture as opposed to an earth culture. So how are you doing in learning what is right? How are you doing at not mixing and mingling the things of the earth with God's standards? I want to encourage you today to be really, really aware of that and to dive into that and to be asking Holy Spirit to show you where you're mixing and mingling. You know, some of those things, they sneak in like the little foxes that want to tear up the field. Because I'll tell you, the demonic does not want you walking in the fullness of the promises, the power, and the authority of Scripture. Because as we do that, we actually do shift culture. We shift the world around us. We bring healing. We bring the fullness of who Jesus is. And that's what we're created for. The demonic knows that. So today, just be alert. And when you see those areas, make the shift. Go before the Lord. Humbly confess our sins. He, is, he will forgive us. He'll bring healing, he'll bring freedom, and he so wants to transform us to think his way, because his way is always best. And as we learn to think his way, we will do what is right in his sight, which means we will dance 
through the storms. Thank you for joining me again today. It's been so good to be with you. We go, um, we're, we actually put up a video on both Facebook and YouTube five days a week, Monday through Friday at 8.15 Eastern time. So I want to invite you to join us. Also share this with others. Come back and join us. Visit the website, ruthhendrickson.org. Join the family, sign up for that email list. And I also want to invite you to subscribe, rate and review the podcast, which is Real Truth with Ruth. Again, so glad to have you join me. Um, look forward to next time you're able to, we're able to be together and diving into the word of God and growing. But today, that love of the Lord will enable you to dance even through the fiercest storms. Great day to do some dancing. Have so much fun and be blessed.